Yeah, you know, so uh, Connor, I just wanna I just wanna ask you a couple of questions about your military service. I'm I'm doing a civics project on this. I'm a twelfth grader. And then we have a civic action plan thing, and then they're pretty much asking us to do a civic action plan, and then my civic action plan was uh uh we have veterans who they're getting they're getting older and stuff. Like my original plan was to talk to World War Two vets, but I'm a procrastinator. So <laughs> Well, they, I, I don't know how many more we have left, too. So, like they're, yeah, they're getting I mean, up there. I mean, we have a, we have, we have a couple hundred thousand, mm. but I mean, I mean, they're gonna be gone in like the next decade or so. So it's, yeah, yeah they're, it's, yeah, it's pretty much, yeah, they're pretty much gone. Mm. Just the sad part. Yeah. Well, like, uh, just so, first of all, uh, like, where were you deployed? Which war did you fight in? So I fought in what was called the Global War on Terror. Um, it, it was basically the the past twenty year military adventure, I guess you would call it, uh, caused by the nine eleven terror attacks, nine eleven two thousand one. So, and uh, I deployed to Iraq in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Oh, uh, how what was like? What did he do in Iraq? So I, I actually did a, a fairly relatively calm job. Uh, I did something called supply administration, supply logistics. So basically what I did was uh, property accounting and I did uh, what what's called a due and status file. So basically it was my job to order, record and distribute. Uh, I worked as a part of a warehouse with probably 20 or 30 other people. And what we did is we, we got orders from units that were deployed in the field, people who needed uh, new armor, new electronics, new jammers, new paint, <laughs> new new cold weather equipment, all that kind of stuff. And they would come in with requisitions. We would take the requisitions, send it out to what would be called the military industrial complex. They would fulfill those orders. They would get to get it to us fairly quickly because Iraq was a prioritized uh, theater of combat. We would receive the gear, inventory it, throw it into the warehouse while we were waiting for the owners to come pick it up and then make sure the people who actually ordered it got what they needed. Um, so basically kind of like being a, uh, a, a retail warehouse for people at war. That's what I did. <laughs> oh, uh, like how were, how, like, what was your, what, how would you say your general military experience was like as, as an aggregate? Like, awesome. Um, four, uh, I loved it. Your military yeah. Service. yeah, I, I loved it. Um, I, I joined the Marine Corps, which is probably the most intense branch out of all of them. So even if you're a supply administrator, somebody who's supposed to have a very boring job, the Marine Corps still teaches you to shoot. I still got to shoot, you know, machine guns. I still got to shoot grenade launchers. I still got to fire rockets. I still got to, well, hold on. I didn't technically fire a rocket, but I did get to uh, see rockets fired. Um, I got to be around tanks. I got to be around armored vehicles. I got to be, you know, around helicopters. Um, I got to fly military transports. Um, so, so I basically got a really good, oh, I got to throw grenades. That was fun. Uh, um, so, so I basically got to do a lot of really cool things and do a lot of really cool training that was combat oriented. And thankfully I didn't have to use too much of it specifically in my day-to-day -day job. But the cool thing about the Marine Corps in particular is they, they do take a higher standard to how they train their people. So I got really good training from some of the best people imaginable, uh, almost all of my combat instructors were veterans of the war on terror, and most of my combat instructors, instructors had been in the Battle of Fallujah, which was one of the bigger battles uh, in the Iraq theater at the time. Uh, so, like, so like, uh, can you give us a rundown on, like, first of all, when you got into the military, like, what did you, what did you do? Like, essentially, I'm asking you to describe boot camp. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, oh, yeah, boot camp is or actually maybe give cool. us and give us some other details besides the ones you gave in your video, which I loved, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So wait, wait. So do you want me to be overly specific about boot camp or do you want me to be vague ab about like the pipeline that most Marines and most military members go through? Oh, uh, OK. For the purpose of my project, mm. for the first part, can you be vague? And then for the second part, can you actually go into specifics? Because I'm actually genuinely curious. Sure, absolutely. But so, then, but then, like, please, please make it very clear, though. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be concise and clear and vague and specific at the same time. So, <laughs> um, so, all right. So for the vague pipeline, okay, v vague pipeline of what most military people go through. Um, so what most military people go through, and specifically what Marines go through, 
is they go through boot camp. Boot camp is 13 weeks of very intense training. You're taught to do drill, which is basically marching and how to manipulate a rifle in a drill setting. You are taught um, the history and the applications of violence, I guess is the most tactful way to put it. And you are you are taught marksmanship, you're taught how to swim, you're taught how to do a whole bunch of really uh, basic and rudimentary functions as simple as uh, how do you get dressed and how do you make a bed? Uh, because what you're doing is you're effectively taking civilians and you're teaching, you're assuming that a civilian knows nothing about how to live and then you're teaching them the military way to live. Um, so, so that's really what boot camp is. And there is a lot of screaming and a lot of running and a lot of crying and a lot of sweating. Um, and there's some shooting guns and there's all of that kind of fun stuff. And uh, drill instructors are terrifying. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, o overall, like a pretty crazy experience. Like it, it really changes the way that you see the world. And then after 13 weeks of boot camp for the Marine Corps in particular, you do you do combat training. So there's two combat schools for the Marine Corps. One of them is the School of Infantry, and one of them is Marine Combat Training. School of Infantry, uh, School of Infantry specifically trains uh, infantrymen or grunts, and it also teaches grunt-related uh, troops. So it's a it's a combination of a combat school and a school for specific jobs. And basically what happens is if you're a grunt, uh, which is just a um, pedestrian term for infantrymen, you will first do basic infantry skills. And then after that, you'll branch off into your grunt specialization. So basically if you're a mortarman, you'll go train on mortars. If you're a machine gunner, you'll train on machine guns. If you're, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some other folks that do grunt stuff and go to school of infantry. But if you're a line infantryman, you'll train in line infantry. And um, everybody will cross train across platforms. So if there's ever a need to fill in in a different school, you will at least have like a rudimentary knowledge of how to fill in in those slots. But basically the, the hyper specialized training for each um, specialization um, is reserved for those specialists. So mortar mortarmen will be very specifically trained in how to run mortars. Machine gunners will be very specifically trained in how to run machine guns and line infantry will be very specifically trained in uh, line infantry tactics. Um, so that, that school of infantry. Marine combat training is a four to five week abridged course for basically everybody else. Administrators, um, supply reps, motor transport drivers, all of those kinds of people. And that five week course is basically an abbreviated line infantry course where you learn movement, camouflage, uh, squad tactics, hand signals, how to shoot a machine gun, how to shoot a grenade launcher, all that kind of stuff. It, it's actually a really cool experience. I it's insane. You don't sleep much, but you do a lot of cool stuff. And then after that, you go to your basic school. So I think my basic school was like another five or six weeks where I learned supply administration. And all they do is they just teach you the rudiments of your job. That way you can perform your job. And then they send you out to the Fleet Marine Corps. And the Fleet Marine Corps, uh, most contracts are four years long. So it was basically a four to six month pipeline to finally become a Marine, like a fully trained, certified, whatever Marine. And then I spent three and a half years actually being a Marine. Uh, so, um, so you mentioned, you mentioned a couple emotions, like crying, like all that stuff. Like what, what do you mean when you say crying? Like did people like genuinely cry and cry? Yep. yep. People break. Um, so, so boot camp is very specifically a, an arduous social separation from the rest of the world. So back when I went, you were actually only allowed snail mail. So literally traditional mail, writing it out on pieces of paper and sending it out to people. You weren't allowed a cell phone. You weren't allowed to use the base phone. You were essentially socially isolated for 13 weeks, except for traditional mail. And on top of that, you wanted to you you wanted that separation. You you wanted to be separate from the rest of the world because your experiences were so intense. It can't really relate to the rest of your life. Being being a civilian and being in Marine Corps boot camp, at least, it is such a, a totally wild, different psychological and social environment that a lot of like the morality and a lot of what is perceived as good inside the civilian world is actually inverted in the military, so or the Marine Corps in specific. So uh, oftentimes you are taught that violence is bad in the civilian world. In the Marine Corps, violence is good. 
you are taught, uh, you know, you are taught to be very caring and empathetic as a civilian. Uh, as a marine, as a marine, you're taught that uh, caring and sympathy only extends to your inner tribal group, and even then, not so much. You don't extend empathy to weak uh, to weak people, and that's kind of inculcated in the culture. So it's such a, it's such a culture shock. And it's such a different way of viewing the world from like traditional American civilian society that it it's almost beneficial to leave your previous psychological self behind. Um, yeah, and I'll kind of kind of leave it there for now. Oh, and this is kind of a joke question. Sure. But like, how would Destiny do in boot camp? How would Destiny do in boot camp? Oh man, he would have to learn to shut his smart mouth. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think I think Destiny would hey, actually Destiny, do. Watching this, I love you, man. He would actually really do well in the Air Force, like uh, because the Air Force specifically goes after brainiacs. Um, so if he got into the physical fitness side of it, he would probably do phenomenal in the Air Force. Um, as far as the Marines go, though, he might um, he might have to enjoy running a little bit more than he does right now. And, and that <laughs> that's the that's the other thing too is um, uh, oftentimes like really soft high school kids are sent to Marine Corps boot camp and their the training is based off of what can we take like if you can do four pull-ups when you first show up then that's capable of passing the minimum metric of what is needed to uh needed to like be a marine basically um but by the time you leave boot camp it's basically trained to double or triple your physical output um it's trained to double or triple like your maybe not triple your running speed, but probably decrease your running speed uh, per mile by ten to twenty percent. Um, it's designed to increase your uh, capacity, mental and emotional capacity for combatives, um, increase your mental and emotional uh, capacity for violence, basically. And so, really, you could take any kid, any kid off of the streets of America, no matter how sweet uh, or kind, and if you sent them to Marine Corps boot camp, you would have a completely different human being at the end of the 13 weeks. It's, it's that transformative and it's that tuned in as an institution. If I may ask, what were you like before you joined boot camp? Like really nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I, I was kind of a jerk, uh, before I joined too. But but no, I, I was a I was an angry kid with a chip on my shoulder and I was really nice, but I found that the world wasn't nice to me or nice oh, to hey, nice people. Like What's that? Sounds like me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so um so what happens after you're nice and people aren't so nice back is you stop being nice. And that's kind of where I was when I was 17. And I did have a chip on my shoulder and I did want to prove to myself that I was capable of handling intense things. And uh, also 9-11 occurred when I was 13 years old. So that was a pretty formative experience for me. And so I wanted to help or maybe not help. I wanted to serve and I wanted to prove to myself that I could do something intense and hardcore. And the Marine Corps happened to be that thing. Oh, uh, please, if you don't mind, can you go into your experiences of 9-11 and then maybe yeah. how it shaped, how it shaped, how it made you into a military guy eventually? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so nine eleven, I like to say, is like my generation's Pearl Harbor. So I'm a little bit older than you. I, I think I'm almost double your age now at this point. Yeah. You're um, sure. Yeah. So, so basically, yeah. When you were asking, like, hey, do you know any older veterans? I'm like, I'm an older veteran. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, um, but basically, like, yeah, nine eleven was wild, and I, I don't know if you want to edit this out for the sake of um the students, but I'll, I'll try. Oh, not by to... the way, about that about mm. that like i don't know if i'm gonna if i'm gonna use any part of any videos of any interviews i do with vets sure yeah okay totally cool um but but just i'll by try way, to i'm only asking you to be be less profane for my convenience <laughs> <laughs> all right fair enough fair enough um yeah yeah so the yeah so so basically 9 11 itself so I'll, I'll try to use tactful terms to describe it uh, but, but basically what happened on 9-11 was I showed up to school. I, I was a middle schooler at the time. I was 13 or 14. So not much younger, um, than, than, uh, people in high school and the, uh, in gym class, which was my first period. So it must've been like seven thirty, seven forty-five in the morning, maybe a little bit later. They, they literally rolled out the television and the first tower was already on fire. 
and there were so many live cameras. Uh, I could be making this memory up, but I don't think I am. There were so many live cameras on the tower as it was on fire that like we we were still wondering whether or not it was an accident while the second plane came in. And then the second plane came in on live television and we're like, all right, this is this is a terrorist attack. This is intentional. Um, and even though I was in Florida, the, the entire country just came to a standstill. Like teachers stopped teaching. Everybody stopped talking. We were just watching television, um, j- just watching what was happening the entire time. So probably for two straight hours, like, like literally into my chemistry class, we watched what happened, which was basically the the planes coming in, them hitting the buildings, and then people taking their own lives for an hour and a half. So uh, that was basically because the flames were so bad and there was no way to escape that people chose to jump. And so it, it's something very weird and kind of haunting when you're that age and you're literally watching people choose uh, to end their own life rather than face fire. Um, and there's also something so morally grotesque about them being normal nine to five wage workers and then be, basically being murdered on live television. Um, that was so haunting and like horrible that I think it just like shattered the psyche of like everybody in my generation. And I think there was two responses to it. Um, a smaller percentage of the population basically said, I'm going to join the military and I'm going to do harm to whoever did this to us. Uh, that was all of my friends um, who joined the military with me. And there was a whole other people who just acted like it never happened and uh, just kind of ignored um, ignored what happened that day. And sometimes, uh, maybe this is a little bit too uh, too personal, um, but I, I just wonder what would have happened if I was in the latter category, if I just ignored what gone on, lived a normal life, never did what I did. Um, and I don't think I would ever want to be that person, but at the same time, like I, I wonder about the, I wonder about the experiences of being a, a military person and just how it changes you, and whether or not there's like a different version of me uh, that would have done differently. And I just don't think there is. I don't think I could have seen what I seen and not do what I did. So. Oh, so like, so like, like uh, you had nine eleven. That was that was a uh, monumentous occurrence in your generation. Mm-hmm. Like. Like, did you make up your mind at that moment that, hey, I'm going to be a military guy? Yeah, um, it wasn't, it was always kind of in the cards for me. Like, I always knew knew I wanted to do something um, security related. So whether that was be a cop or be in the military or something like that, I've always been very interested in history. I've always been very interested in uh, the military and violence and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, so yeah, like, I mean, that pretty much cemented it for me. It wasn't a conscious thought the day of or a day later. Um, it was actually a conscious thought maybe when I was 16. Um, it was actually kind of funny. So when I was 16, I was actually watching this really, uh, I'm going to say it, cringe music video by Green Day called Wake Me Up When September Is Ends. And it's, a, it's an anti-war song. And I was actually sitting with uh, my ex-girlfriend and my friend at the time. (laughs) And I'm just watching this like cringe anti-war video. And I was like, I'm gonna go do that shit. Like, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna go do that thing. (laughs) Connor, again, it's completely for my convenience. I'm asking you not to swear. Yeah, well, hold on. For your your eardrums or for editing purposes? No, no, editing purposes, not for... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Watching so, your videos for a while, man. Okay, all right, cool. So I'll try to use a yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna go do something similar to that. Um, so I never, I never wanted to be an infant infantryman. I never wanted to kill anybody. Um, I'm, I was raised as a Christian pacifist. My, my parents were very pacifistic when we were coming up. But uh, basically, I knew I wanted to contribute to the war effort. Both of my grandparents are World War II veterans, and so I. I knew I was going to do something. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew I was going to go. So. Oh, I was just going to ask, like, what your military, what your family's military history was. You just mentioned two grandparents in World War II. What about the rest yeah. of your family? Yeah, so uh, my grandpa on my mother's side was a World War II bombardier. 
he trained and got deployed in 1945. I don't know how many bombing runs he went on, but one of the major things he did that I think he really valued as a part of his experience was he flew American prisoners of war from Germany back to uh, the United Kingdom. So he, he basically took his bomber, which is supposed to be destroying cities, and he filled it up with half-starved American prisoners of war and flew them back home. So I know he got a lot of emotional value out of that, but I also think the war in general just tormented him for the rest of his life. Um, he was uh, an alcoholic and kind of stoic and indulged in some self-destructive personal behavior that affected the rest of my family. And while everybody admired him, he was kind of known as a jerk. Um, and, and that's my, my father or my mother's father. My dad's dad was like the sweetest man in the entire world. And he was deployed to Guam as a, as a CB, basically an engineer. So he was responsible for building things. And I don't think he saw any action. So he just, he just went to Guam and helped build the bases and all that kind of stuff. And I, I don't think he took any fire or, or hurt anybody. Um, and he was a fairly normal guy. He came back, he started a business, he helped every, he helped other people out. And, um, I don't think, um, he let his wartime experiences, if he had anything that was horrible, he never told anybody about it. So. Oh, I also have an, oh. sorry, one more oh, thing. Uh, oh. I have a, I have an uncle, um, and a cousin, uh, who are both infantrymen in the army. And, uh, both of them had some pretty intense experiences, uh, in the war and terror and before, um, the infantryman who's my cousin went to Haiti, um, during the earthquake disaster and basically had to work with, um, all the dead bodies and kind of try to handle, handle the sanitation. And then, um, he had a rough story from that. And then, uh, my uncle, uh, I think also did the infantry, uh, in the army and he deployed to Afghanistan and he had a rough deployment where some people didn't make it back. So. Ooh. Uh, if you don't mind, can you, with the experiences they've told you, if they're like, can you, can you elaborate? On sure. It? Um, so if I remember this correctly, um, I can't, I can't remember if I'm mixing up a, a book I read and my cousin's story, but I know that, um, basically his deployment to Haiti messed them up pretty good. Um, and, and basically I might be mixing up a story with this from, a, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised off if it was far off from his experiences. Basically the earthquake was so bad. And so many people died that as the American relief ships were pulling into the harbor, they were sailing through bodies, just like an ocean filled with bodies. So, Ooh. yeah. So, so basically having to deal with that and then having to deal with the locals who were, you know, half starved securities, garbage, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I think that jacked them up pretty good. Um, and then I don't know if he had an infantry deployment, but, um, basically I know he was an infantry man and if, and if he deployed, then I'm sure he probably saw some intense stuff because infantry men are the people who actually, you know, kill other people. Um, then my uncle, he was, I want to say he was, um, airborne or a ranger. He maybe not a ranger, but I think he was airborne. And, uh, that's actually part of the reason why, why my cousin became a soldier and became an infantryman. Um, and he actually deployed in his either fifties or sixties, my uncle, and he 50s deployed. Sixties. Yeah. Yeah. He, he deployed, I, I think I want to say, uh, as a reservist, um, but he deployed as a part of like a security detachment to a base in Afghanistan. And while he was on that base in Afghanistan, um, I'm pretty sure a suicide bomber blew up the checkpoint outside the base. And I think it killed, uh, one of his friends and some of the military police that were there. So even though he was physically okay and he just had to deal with the aftermath of the bombing, um, I'm pretty sure that that jacked him up pretty hard. So. Oh, uh, you're mentioning how like both your cousin and your uncle and your grand and your grandfather got pretty messed up from this encounter. Like, what was the experience that you had with your friends, friends during? And then your friends after they they've seen something yeah. they've seen something horrible like what are what are like interpersonal relationships like between between those people? Yeah, it's um so we we all love each other. Um, that's number one. So veteran veterans love veterans more than they love anybody else. So if there's a um, obviously if there's like a veteran who didn't deploy, we'll all punk on them. Um, if there's a veteran who didn't see any violence, we'll, we'll punk on them or whatever, because it's all about a hierarchy of experience and that, that hierarchy of experience 
is basically the more intense things that you do and the more intense things that you see, uh, we're going to respect you more because you've done more than everybody else, basically. Um, but that always comes with a cost and everybody's a little bit different. So I know people who have done and seen horrific things and they're, I don't want to say completely fine, but they were always a little off to begin with, to be honest. <laughs> like they were, they were always sociopaths or uh, psychopaths to begin with. And I don't use that as like a, like a moral judgment. I'm just saying that they, uh, they are morally built for, con or they're mentally and emotionally built for conflict and they just handle conflict incredibly well. Um, and, and so basically killing people or having their friends die or whatever, like it messes with them a little bit, but not that much. Um, and then I would say there's probably a middle ground character, uh, um, middle ground territory that I think is fairly normal. Um, and I think that middle ground territory is basically like, it jacks you up, like seeing what people can do to each other. It jacks you up, but you're not going to let it ruin the rest of your life, or at least you're going to try not to. So you might have episodes, you might get angry, you might get drunk, you might scream a little bit. Um, but you're going to, you're going to move on. Right. Um, and then there's just some people who something that they see just fundamentally alters the way they interact with the world and it actually breaks their brain. Um, whether or not that's for a long time or for a short time is kind of up to the individual and how they want to, um, some people just can't be fixed. Um, and sometimes it takes work. So I would say, even though my deployment, um, was fairly tame, um, I would say that I did deal with some psychological issues just from what I learned about what human beings could do to each other. And also from maybe secondary experiences from people I was deployed with and my friends and what we all trained to do and what we could do and what I knew uh, I was capable of. And then uh, also I spent four years in law enforcement later and basically actually doing the things that I had wondered about for a really long time. And then also seeing what human beings could do with each other. Um, I handled violence and stress better than I thought that I would. Um, but at the same time, it does, uh, there's a cost. There, there, there's a cost to everything you see and everything you do when it comes to the realm of interpersonal human violence. Oh, uh, like, like, uh, along those same lines about, about violence and stuff, like, uh, mm -hmm. like, like the, are uh, like when, when people join the military, like, what are their initial views on violence versus after they get out of their military? What do they still think <laughs> about violence? Uh, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> and uh, the, the reason why I'm, at, I'm saying that is because I think um, the Navy and I think the Air Force is a little bit less transformative. I, I think they still have a very sanitized perspective of violence. Um, I also think the Army, if you're talking about support staff, sometimes they still have a very... Uh, idealistic uh, perception of violence. I would say the Marine Corps infantry, uh, well, the Marine Corps in general, um, infantrymen in general, and any combat arms. So basically anybody who actually, uh, uh, what, what do they call it? Put, puts warheads on foreheads. Um, anybody who does any of that kind of work will understand um that it's not a game. They'll understand that real people have been killed, real people have been hurt, sometimes the right people, sometimes the wrong people. They oftentimes will know about what can be done to them. Um, so for instance, part, part, of the, part of the trauma of killing people um, or part of the trauma of seeing people killed is realizing how vulnerable you are. So one of the things that is really emotionally frustrating about being a veteran and not having any veterans around is actually that like we're trained as a team. We're when we're in the military, we're trained to have four people in a fire team, 12 people in a platoon. We deploy as a group. Uh, even if you're like an artilleryman or a motor T guy or something like that, there, there's this really tight knit family that works like a, works like a machine and everybody's a cog and everybody does um, what they're supposed to do. And as a result, the machine keeps spinning. Once you become a civilian, there's no machine, there's no team, there's no family, there's no nothing. Um, so part of the loneliness of being a veteran who doesn't know any veterans is uh, basically being knowing how vulnerable you are and not having your team with you. So uh, I know how easy it is to kill a human being and it literally gives me anxiety that I don't have my comrades 
with me because that's how I dealt with violence in the past. I was in a pack. I was in a group. And I knew that if anybody tried to hurt me or kill me, then I would have a team of people who would defend me. And as a civilian, you just don't have that. And that's uh, incredi incredibly isolating. And I think it gives a lot of veterans anxiety that they don't even think about. Uh, how do you think how do you think the general populace relate how, no, not relates but how do you think the general populace reacts to stories of violence told by vets they like, what have been your experience yeah it's not great um and i don't expect it i don't expect it to be great um be, because it's one of two things it's either like horror um it, it's horror which is understandable um or it's uh it's like a gi joe valorization so so it's either this like hyper clean hyper sanitized uh gi joe mentality where whatever we did or whatever we do is justified and even if we do terrible things or if we see terrible things it's okay because it's all part of the game um or it's just repulsion um and yeah, fear um uh yeah but but even that hasn't gone away so so for instance like i i think you know honor our troops support our troops like all that kind of stuff i don't think anybody knows what that means uh, i don't think anybody knows what that means and uh just as an example i have a friend uh or a family friend he's not my friend uh but a family friend who was uh, who was a navy seal and he killed people and he killed really bad people but his mom was a Christian and didn't believe that killing was acceptable. So when he got home, she actually like rejected him, like did not want to oh, talk. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't want to talk to him. Didn't want to be in the same room as him, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I have my own problems with communicating with people, the things that I've been through and the things that I've done. And uh, I have my own problems, but I don't think I've ever had a family member, let alone an immediate family member, reject me completely because of what I'd done and who I was. And um, I, I heard that and I just broke because I was like, he he's already dealing with what he did. Uh, having your family reject you even more is just like, wow. Like, I, I don't even know how you deal with that. So, I mean, it's isn't it kind of, I, ironic too that like, I, I ardent somebody who rejected somebody be, rejecting somebody because of your Christian values. Well, and my mom tried to try to point that out to her, and it didn't work. So, like, I mean that <laughs> it seems very ironic. Yep, but she took uh, she took thou shalt not kill very literally, and. Um, I think she tried to talk him out of it before. I think she tried to talk him into a different job and he just didn't listen and he did it. And, uh, you know, God bless him because, you know, being a seal is not, not easy. Um, but you know, he paid, he paid the price and he's paying, he's paying a price now, which is basically that he has a strained relationship with his family because of what he did. And, uh, I, that, that, that's the thing is like, um, every family is different. Um, but even my own family, um, I don't think they knew how to process who I was or what I'd done or where I'd been. Um, because when I came home, it was just back to business. It was just, oh, hey, welcome back. We got bills to pay. We got things to do, you know, get back to the civilian world. And um, I think that can be pretty embittering for veterans because even if we don't want like hero worship like you know we walk we walk off the plane and there's a red carpet and people are throwing roses and uh you know girls are screaming our name i don't think anybody would complain about that uh, <laughs> um but but even just like uh, a pat on the shoulder and a beer and somebody being like hey man i'm glad you're back like that even that would go a long way uh towards the alienation that i think veterans feel and, and i think that's partially because um we're volunteers we we volunteer for military service now so it's a choice and so it, it's kind of like it's like going to college like do you go to college or do you go to afghanistan and kill people you know um so that's kind of a, a tough tough psychological bridge to cross
Oh, about that, like, what are, like, with their comrades, like, what are the, what are the, what are the reasons they joined? Like, wh- like, uh, in your, in, in, in your platoon, in, within your comrades, like, what were, what were people's socioeconomic, it was, economic status? It was what cr- were their races? crazy varied. Like, crazy varied. Like, I, I know the stereotype is, like, poor kids uh, escaping bad towns. And that's true. There's plenty of them. Uh, but it was also people like me. There, there was, um, I was raised middle class. I didn't need to enlist. I could have gotten a college degree and then become an officer if I wanted to join the military at all. Uh, but there was plenty of really smart, like, criminally smart um, enlisted people. And there was also a lot of dirt bags and there was a lot of poor kids escaping bad cities. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it was really all over. And part of the reason what I loved about the military and the Marine Corps in particular was that it really was everybody. So I was, um, you know, I had a Burmese friend, like, like I obviously had like white middle-class friends from all over the country. I had white working class friends from all over the country. Um, there weren't any upper-class folk. I'll say that. Um, but I had friends who were Burmese, Cambodian, uh, you know, basically Caribbean black, Northeastern black, Southern black. Um, I had Hispanic friends. One of my, one of my best friends to this day, um, is a first generation Mexican immigrant. Um, I had friends from, uh, you know, like, uh, Venezuela and Brazil. And so, so basically what happened was like the entire world, because, you know, America, is a, you know, a melting pot or gumbo culture. Uh, Basically every single ethnic, national, linguistic and cultural and economic background was in the military and in the enlisted side. So it was actually really cool because you felt like you basically were interacting with a complete cross section of all of the different aspects of America and you were forced to be friends or family and, um, that was an incredible experience. I, I, that was one of my favorite things about the military was meeting so many cool and interesting people from so many different kinds of backgrounds. Yeah. Oh, and going off with that diversity point, like even historically, generally the military, the military has been ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. Like even during like the, like during the civil war, like Vietnam troops were, you know, troops were starting to get integrated and they fought like brothers together mm-hmm. so like what does like having a military experience make you think of like the racial tensions racial tensions it, uh, economic tensions happening within the country at large it almost eliminates it which is actually really cool um so we're we're all reliant on each other for survival and there's no time for bickering so we'll bicker like brothers because it's fun but when <laughs> when it's serious Everybody shuts up and they do their job. And that's really cool. And like, what's the general perception of the civilian, the civilian world from coming from a military's perspective? Oh, about we, like racial yeah, we, relations and all that stuff. Oh, uh, well, f- first off, I-, I would say there's like an elitism. Like, obviously we, I, I hate to say it, but we hate civilians. <laughs> so, um, so we're always looking for veterans in the crowd, or at least I am anyways. Uh, so j- just as an example, I went to a party, uh, with my wife and I saw a guy with a, a big scar on his shoulder. It was like the, this little circular scar on the top part of his shoulder. And I'm like, oh shit. Could, sorry. Um, oh man. <laughs> um, there, uh, because every, every military veteran, at least every Marine gets a smallpox, a uh, smallpox vaccine. And what they do is they take a little needle and they jab it into your arm repeatedly. And generally speaking, there's going to be a large circular scar when they're done. So like, it's, it's actually not like a single injection. It's actually like a a tattoo needle that they hit you with repeatedly. So, uh, so I was like, Oh, that dude was at least in the Navy, at least in the Marine Corps. Um, you know, or, you know, he's in some kind of military branch. Like I, I want to talk to him. And then I talked to him and he was like, no, man, this was a firework accident when I was like 14. And I was like, I was like emotionally shattered. <laughs> like, I was like, I was like, I thought I had somebody to talk to. I thought I had a friend. I thought we were going to be able to compare, you know, deployments and units and branches and history and like all that kind of stuff. I thought we were going to just going to have like a three hour conversation. And basically what you told me is that uh, you were a drunk idiot when you were 15 and uh, and he was and he was my age too, and so there there's a certain amount of um, moral judgment. Like I, I love my friends, I love my civilian friends, 
Um, I really do, because I, I think a lot of them are fundamentally good people. But I can't pretend that there isn't some moral judgment from me um, that you saw the same thing that I did and you didn't think that you needed to do anything about it. And that that's kind of like, um, it, it makes me bitter. I'm not going to lie. Um, it makes me bitter about civilians who saw what I saw on 9-11 and were just like, yeah, okay, well, I'm just going to go live my life now. Like, I, I don't... I couldn't move past it. I had to, I had to do something. So, um, so yeah, so, so there, there's definitely like a, a veteran versus civilian judgment. And then I'm sorry if there was another part of that question, but that was the, that was the first part at least. Oh no, go on any tangent you'd like. Everything is valuable. No, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's pretty much it. I think there's a certain, even, even if there's not a deployment or a war, um, I think military veterans have a certain amount of elitism when it comes to uh, civilians because we just understand some very difficult things that most people won't have to experience. That's not to say that most people don't have difficulty in their life, um, but the, you know, not getting sleep for days on end, shooting machine guns, fighting with your friends, uh, you know, doing fire watch, which is basically where you get your sleep interrupted so you can watch everybody else uh, while they sleep, uh, you know, mortal threat, mortal danger. Um, you know, crazy, crazy aircraft, crazy naval ships, crazy guns, crazy explosives. Um, being around all that kind of stuff is, is very exciting and it's awesome and it's really cool. Um, so when you have that experience as a part of your background, you tend to look down on people who don't have comparable experiences. So uh, about about the mortal danger, have you ever been in an experience where that was imminent? Mm hmm. So if you don't mind, can you describe it? Yeah. Um, so, so th there were really two experiences that I would have uh, said I was um, paranoid about and uh, could have resulted in my death. Um, one of them was accidental and one of them, well, uh, okay. So two, two of them were accidental and one of them, I thought that I was going to have to kill somebody. Um, so, <laughs> um, so the first near accident or the first close call was uh, we were on a rifle range in Japan uh, preparing for our deployment in Iraq and we were all shooting our guns and basically doing drills. So we're, you know, putting two in the chest and one in the head on the target. And uh, basically we're standing, we're trying to get everybody trained as quickly as possible. So we're all standing basically shoulder to shoulder while we're doing this. Well, the problem with that is that the, uh, you know, the M16, I had an M16, uh, not an M4. Uh, the M16 rifle kicks out the brass, which is the the casing for the uh, for the rifle round. Um, it kicks it out to the side. So what was happening was the rifle rounds were um, hitting uh, us in our necks and our faces, and they were burning our necks and our faces. So um, what ended up happening was it was so hot that day. It was probably like 105, 110 degrees. And we'd been in the field for a week, so we didn't have uh, sufficient lubrication for our rifle. You're supposed to oil it. Um, so what was happening was our guns were overheating and they were literally shooting by themselves. So literally you're standing there and your your rifle is pointed down at the ground and your gun just goes off randomly. Um, and that happened a few times. It didn't happen with my rifle, but a few, like literally we, we had like, you call them negligent dis discharges. And we had a few uh, negligent discharges and basically the, the trainers never stopped the training cycle. They just yelled at us, but they didn't realize that the guns were cooking off. And uh, so what happened was uh, these these rounds are going off randomly, like literally just exploding into the ground between our feet. And so what happens is uh, I catch some brass rounds to my neck. It actually lands in my body armor. I actually had a, uh, a bullet casing imprint burned into my neck for the better part of a week, but I just take it because I'm not a wussy. And then um, one of the guys who is a wussy takes a casing in the neck and he freaks out and he steps forward of the line, which is already horrible because he could have gotten killed doing what he did. And they spun around and he swung his rifle around. And for me, like, I know like the risks were very low statistically, but I could see like, even though he was like 10, 15 feet away, I could basically see into his barrel. Cause all I'm watching as my adrenaline picks up is this guy basically turning and like the rifle barrel coming towards my face. And I'm just imagining like, oh, this is it. You know, I'm just going to, you know, this dude's gun is going to go off because of a cook off and I'm going to catch a round into the head and that's going to be it. 
Um, and thankfully he flags, the, he flags the line, a trainer tackles him, yells at him, kicks him off of the firing range, all that kind of stuff. I don't die, thank God. Um, and then uh, ba basically, you know, I can still, I can still see the barrel, but it, you know, it's not, it's not a crazy big deal on what, you know, you can do for the military, but it was still something that stuck out as me as like, oh, I'm definitely going to catch a round of the face right now. <laughs> um, the second time was I had a uh, platoon member who got high on cough medicine uh, because there was nothing to drink. We weren't allowed to have alcohol or drugs uh, in Iraq. So he got high on cough medicine and then he wanted to play the trust game, which I had never heard of at the time. Um, what the trust game is, is where you pretend to load a rifle and then you ask somebody if uh, they trust you. And if they say yes, you pull the trigger. But the thing is, you never loaded a bullet. So the gun just goes click. And so basically, I had somebody who was high on cough medicine load a, what I thought, load a rifle, um, point it at my head and then say, do you trust me? Uh, and I said, no. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, fucking, excuse me, please, you know, stop. And, uh, I said no. And then eventually I had to say no a whole bunch. I actually like got up to go after him and he pointed the rifle at me even more intently. So I just sat there and waited to see what he did. He got bored and he stumbled off. So that was another time that I thought I might, uh, not make it. Then the, were both of those your friends or comrades? Um, so the first guy, I don't know. We were a bit, part of a big unit, so it was a battalion. So there's like companies. So it was probably just some random dude on a company. I don't know specifically who it was, but he was a comrade, not a friend, right? Um, this guy, I would still consider a friend to this day. So even though he did something egregious uh, that I see as a major violation of safety rules, Marine Corps culture my personal ethos all that kind of stuff um i would still consider him a friend and i would still do things with him to this day if he asked me and then uh another thing about this is people have been killed in the trust game before so um i was deployed in 2007 i'm pretty sure if you google marine corps trust game there was either somebody who was killed right before me um or right after me uh timeline wise uh because they they messed up the trust game and they killed they killed them they killed their friend um, then the other time was basically, uh, I was, uh, I was working, uh, late. We had some stuff to do. Um, I, we're normally supposed to have battle buddies. I told my battle buddy to go ahead and go home because the last bus was leaving the area and there was basically an on base shuttle. And so he caught the last shuttle. I stayed for another hour. I finished working and then I walked, uh, I walked back to the can, um, where I was staying. And basically it was like maybe like a mile walk. It's not very long. Um, but you're not supposed to be alone, right? And so it's late at night. It's probably 1130. And uh, I see a couple of Arab dudes. Um, and, and we have Arab people on base, right? We we have people who sell us stuff. We have uh, interpreters. So so seeing Arab dudes is not out of the out of the ordinary. But was what was out of the ordinary was they were kind of skulking. And, um, I also heard like some like metal clinking, like I heard like clink, 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 clink as they were skulking across the roadway. So I was like, oh snap, that's alarming. And then, uh, they were skulking in the area of the explosive ordnance disposal, uh, shack. So I don't think they, uh, store any munitions there, but there is like really sensitive equipment, really expensive equipment, satellite phones, electronics, and basically, um, anti- explosive vehicles and equipment so if you were going to take out something sensitive inside the american base that would actually be one of the things that you wanted to take out especially in iraq with the improvised explosive device uh problem that was like the main thing we were contending with at the time um so i'm kind of debating whether or not i should do anything about it and then i just hear some more metal clinking and some more hushed voices in arabic and i'm just like all right i gotta do something um so i literally like sneak into a shadow load up my magazine, put around in, uh, around in the chamber. And I basically have my thumb on the safety. And like, if ba basically, if I see something really shady, I'm literally like about to take off the safety and just blast these dudes. And, um, I creep up on them to see what they're doing and they're smoking hash. They're, they're smoking hashish. So they, they have a, they have a hookah. They're sitting in a little corner. They're whispering to each other. Uh, you know, they're, they're you know, they're not, 
Um, they're not doing anything more nefarious than a couple of pot smoking teenagers inside the United States. So I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> they, they, they didn't even know. I, like in, in the creepy thing is like they didn't even know I was there. Um, and the reason why they didn't know was because I basically kicked back. Um, I know I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but still, um, my training kicked back in. I literally, I snuck into the closest shadow. Um, I stood by a generator so they couldn't hear me loading my rifle. I loaded my rifle. Um, the way that I approached them was in the sand. So I basically, instead of in the gravel road or the well-lit roadway, um, I actually jumped off of the roadway and like crept up on them from like a sand embankment. I stayed in the shadows the entire time. And then I basically sat there for probably like 90 seconds um, just watching them smoking hookah so I could make sure 100% that they weren't doing something dangerous or nefarious. And while that ended up being something completely innocent, and I literally just unloaded my rifle and went home, um, to me, up until I knew it was hookah, I was under the so uh, I was under the psychological impression that I was about to kill two people. So while it ended up not being a big deal, it was a big deal to me up until I found out that it wasn't a big deal. Um, so yeah, so th those those would be the three times that. Um, I know that to, to all the military people who are listening, who have actually done very serious things, I promise you, I have more hardcore cop stories. Um, but for my personal military experience, those would probably be the times that I either thought I was going to get killed or the time that I thought I was going to kill somebody. Oh, have you ever been, been in an encounter with the enemy ever? Like, I, like in, in more, in more safe circumstances? No. Um, uh no so so basically the epws enemy prisoners of war um we did have a detention facility on base but my shop was not around there um i do have friends who have worked on um interrogations i do have friends who are infantrymen who have killed people i do have friends who have um really done some like really intense stuff like very intense um I was uh, friends with the forward air, air combat controller. I was friends with, and still am, um, I was friends with the, an intelligence person who basically uh, <laughs> tracked down ISIS's uh, social media and used that to create uh, targeted strikes. Holy uh, shit. Yeah. Um, I have an infantryman who uh, killed the soldiers of heaven in the battle. I want to say it was in the battle of Najaf. Um, but basically the soldiers of heaven were a Shia apocalyptic death cult. Uh, so you should Google or Wikipedia them. And, um, so I had a friend who killed a few of those guys. And then I've had a friend who, uh, killed some Taliban as well. So, yeah. So like I, I myself am not individual. Oh, I also had a friend who was in recon, uh, who did some, he had some pretty cool stories. Um, so, so I individually have not done, done that much intense stuff when it comes to the military. But I understand it, and I love it. And the people I love most in this world um, have done very, very intense things. Oh, uh, what was uh, Iraq in general like? Like, what was the country like? Like, how are the people? How did they? How did you interact with them? How did they interact with you? Like, what kind of conversations you had? Did you guys share meals and all that? No. Um, and, and you, th there probably are better veterans that you can inter interview for this. Um, so for instance, like some of my, um, some of my friends, or at least one of my friends, um, he did the turnover, um, for Afghani bases. So basically like he literally, um, embedded with local forces, tried to train them up on the local bases, all, all the, all the materials that we were leaving the Afghan national army and the Afghan national police. And then it was literally his job to do an inventory of what we were giving them and then give it to him. Um, so he had some, um, positive and very negative interactions um actually a few of the afghan national police tried to uh they actually killed um they, they broke into the american side of the compound they killed one of the civilian contractors and then he uh my friend and some of his friends uh killed the afghan national police that were breaking into their compound um so basically not positive <laughs> um he also had some of his friends killed in a grenade attack um, so not positive. And then, um, in Iraq, I had another friend who helped train the Afghan or not the, the Iraqi police, um, to try to get them up to snuff. 
And basically he was saying that uh, they would train them one day and then another day, like an Iraqi police truck would show up and take pot shots at the base. <laughs> so like it was, it wasn't great. Um, I think other people have probably had more positive experiences, but overall my perception of our relations with uh, Afghani or Iraqi security forces and what their civilian population thought of us is, uh, is not positive. I'll put it that way. Oh, did you have any personal interactions with any of the locals? Just interpreters. Um, so there, there was an interpreter um, base, uh, not interpreter base, but like an in interpreter segment that was across from us. And um, they cooked us meals and hung out with us and all that kind of stuff. And they were pretty cool. Um, and then also uh, Turks, um, people from Turkey, they were the primary people who did um, like food on the base. Um, and then also, oh man, um, Ugandans. So I, I know these aren't Iraqis, so I'm probably not answering your question properly. No, 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 uh, no, but... go on. This is interesting. Okay. So, uh, so basically, oh man, like Isla, uh, I kind of didn't, I kind of didn't like everybody except for the Ugandans. And that's because the Ugandans were so much cooler than everybody else. <laughs> like, so, um, so, so basically, um, and then we did have, by the time I was leaving, we did have some Iraqi army on the base, but we, we stayed our distance basically. Cause you know, we, we'd have some neg negative interactions in the past. Um, but Ugandans, um, primarily were the, the contractors, um, on the base. So they did this, they did the on-base security, literally like you go to the chow hall, there's a Ugandan man. So a West African black man in, uh, you know, in body armor and a helmet. Wait, West uh, African. And what's that? West African. Yeah, West African. Um, uh, well, wait, am I wrong? Where's Uganda? Wait, isn't Uganda more east? Well, now, now you got me. Now you got me all messed up. Now I got to find out where Uganda is because, okay, ne ne okay. So let, let, let's skip that part. They they were dark gentlemen, <laughs> and uh, and they were wearing you know like body armor and they had like AK forty sevens and some of them had like M like old, really old M fours or M sixteen. Some of them had AK forty sevens. And, um, and, you know, just every single one of them, like, um, Jambo, I guess is like the greeting in, uh, maybe I'm mixing up languages. Maybe I'm mixing up wait, regions. Wait, Jambo is Swahili. Swahili. Yeah. Which is spoken, which is spoken in Eastern parts of, which is spoken in, in Eastern parts. Okay. All right. So you're, you're more than welcome to correct me on any geographic or linguistic issues oh, with my I'm narrative. I'm not an expert on any of it, this stuff. I'm a 17 year old. Well, Hey, I am, I am a, uh, early to mid 30 year old who, uh, who learns things through trial and error. So, so, <laughs> um, so basically like, um, every time that you see a gentleman, hopefully from Uganda, um, who speaks Swahili? <laughs> um, they were just the nicest guys on the face of the planet and every single time you'd just be like jumbo and they'd be like jumbo like, they were so they were so nice um about everything and um a few of my buddies pulled guard duty with them and they were talking to them and they were like yeah this is actually a really great job for me um you know like none of us have gotten hurt or killed uh we get paid really well especially compared to uh you know what job opportunities are available um, back home so actually like a lot of us like we're, we're slowly but surely adding additions to our homes we're like you know building out our walls but we have to do it slowly because we can't let the neighbors know how much money we have uh, so it's actually um it was really funny getting to know some of their stories and then um they're just the nicest people and then uh basically if you were like rolling around like in a truck or like uh, like we had these uh, Polaris ATVs that we drove around all the time. They're basically uh, all-terrain vehicles that we use to get uh, to and from different parts of the base. Um, you know, you just throw up your hand outside the, the ATV window and you go, Jumbo! And like, the guys are just like, the, the dudes like with AKs are like, Jumbo! <laughs> like, they're, just, they're just so pumped uh, to be alive. Uh, they're so pumped to be alive, be well paid, hanging out with you, and they were just the the nicest dudes on the planet. So it was actually, um, it was actually a really cool experience. So um, if if I remembered correctly, that they're Ugandans, and if Ugandans speak Swahili, and if uh, Jambo is a language in oh, Swahili, oh, uh, I just looked it up. It's <laughs> a it's a official language in four countries: Kenya and Uganda were two of them. I okay, all right. So I I am ninety five percent sure they were from Uganda. Uh, um. So, 
but oh, okay but then then again like a lot of african countries have french as their official language right like equatorial guinea has spanish i yeah. believe so yeah, yeah yeah so so yeah so that i i don't know i i love i love the ugandans and forever have like a really positive uh, association with ugandans and then um tongans so this is completely different segue but i'm gonna do it anyways um, there's a, there's a kingdom, uh, it's an island in the Pacific, it's called Tonga, and everybody who is from that island looks like the rock. So they're five foot five to seven foot tall. They're all built like the rock. They all look like the rock and that's it. <laughs> like so, so it was actually really crazy seeing Tongans because they just like, they just walk in these like tall bricks of people, crazy muscular, you know, same, same like build, same demeanor, same face as the rock. And we were just like, what is this like island kingdom that I have never heard of that just has like genetically cloned the rock a billion times. And apparently they're like the nicest guys too. Um, so yeah, that was also another really interesting experience was just learning of countries that I'd never even heard of. Um, who apparently produced uh, phenomenal, phenomenal warriors uh, <laughs> who who decided to help us out with uh, some base security. But yeah, but, but that that was one of the cooler experiences was seeing seeing and meeting people from all over the world and just understanding how similar and how different um, everybody is. Oh, oh hey, Connor, can you hold up for just a second? Sure. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, go on now. Wait, okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm loving, I'm loving the Ugandans. Yeah, me too, me too. There, there's actually a, there's a comic about them, uh, where, where, uh, you know, like Marines are driving by and they say Jumbo. And li it, never mind. <laughs> I, I'll send it to you, but it's great. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, that's pretty much it. And, and okay, I mean, so we're you guys just literally yelled Jumbo. Yeah, that's that's the only word in Swahili I know. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, but they were so they were so passionate about that one word that it was just a great way. Uh, great Pe people who took something like an incident in my life and an incident in a lot of people's lives that was like stressful and kind of, you know, scary and weird and all that kind of stuff. Being in a foreign country, being at war, not knowing what's going on. Where's the enemy? Where are we? What's going on? You know, all that kind of stuff. And just having like these random, super sweet, crazy, fun, exuberant people uh, who just colored. uh colored the experience with their with their positivity and their enthusiasm um it was are it you was in beautiful. contact with any of them today no 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 we we didn't get that familiar um ba basically the um the stories about what they were doing back home uh, a lot of my buddies learned from doing uh pulling guard duty with them um and i was so busy with my job that i was not picked for that guard duty unfortunately but 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 no like um some of them um some of them literally did trade like uh, social media information with some of uh, my buddies and so like i think they i think they kept up on some level through facebook so so like <laughs> so i don't know i would have to ask around to see if anybody was still uh still in contact with their base security ugandan friends um, but I'm sure it happened. I'm sure other people have probably kept tabs, and, you know, seen what they're up to. Yeah. Oh, like, okay. So, like, on the last day of military mm. service, and the day before the last day, what were those two days like? Oh, un... Oh, and also, if you, un... if you can, uh, what about, like, a month before military service? Um, a month before military service, I was so anxious. I think I could have, like, if I wanted to puke, I probably could have puked at any time of the day. Um, just because, like, you know, hell or high water, you're fundamentally transforming your life for the rest of your life. So I think uh, pre-performance, pre-military anxiety is super high. I think a lot of people um, dip out at the last second. They they back out of their commitment, back out of their contract, and they don't get punished for it. But um, I didn't, and I didn't want to. So I, I think I think pre pre contract jitters is pretty normal. And then like the first two weeks of boot camp, you're going to be 
lost. Um, psychologically, emotionally, physically, you're just going to be lost. So that that's very normal. So if anybody is watching this and they're going to join the military, know that that's normal. Um, the last week or the last month um, and the day before and the day after um, is just joy. It's just joy. It's um, It's such an intense experience. It's so extreme in so many ways that we haven't even talked about um that they're, they're you know basically japan um i was i was stationed in japan for a year and a half and that by itself was a very extreme um experience with a lot of culture clash and a lot of weird stories that we can talk about another time and um basically getting through that anxiety realizing that you're not dead knowing that you have the opportunity to go home knowing that you survived the thing that you signed up for that you didn't know whether or not you were going to come back from. And then finally getting that sense of freedom where you're no longer beholden to the federal government under a contract. Uh, it is one of the best feelings in the world. Like I think I was, I think I was just floating on dopamine uh, the entire drive home because I drove from, um, I was stationed in San Diego when I got out. And I drove up to Los Angeles and then I jumped on a, a highway called the 10 and I drove, I drove it all the way to Florida, uh, with, uh, my pet dog. And <laughs> I think I, I think I just, uh, I saved some, uh, South park and family guy episodes to my phone, uh, cause I knew I wouldn't have cell service. And I just listened to episodes and drove and pet my dog and just had, uh, one of the most beautiful experiences of my life because I, I'd done something crazy. I'd done something intense. I'd done something that I didn't know I was going to come back from and I'd survived it. And now I got to go enjoy the fruits of my life. Uh, so it was, um, a lot harder. Uh, the, the, I would say the year to two years after that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, but it was a beautiful experience, especially the first two days were. Oh, what about a month static. after you got out? Oh, uh, horrible depression. <laughs> Ho horrible depression and horrible anxiety. And it, and it wasn't because I wasn't excited to be doing what I was doing. I was uh, going back to college. I was seeing, I was uh, visiting my, uh, my college friends who were now on the verge of graduation. Um, I was re-acclimatizing to my home. I was spending time with my dog. I was going to school. I was doing all of the things. Um, but I had not reckoned with what I had been through and wouldn't do so for probably another two years because I think I was in denial about how much it changed my life. And uh, so the anxiety, um, the anxiety and the depression and ignoring all of my problems while trying to start my new life was really hard, like really hard. So. Oh, <sighs> oh uh, and, uh, and, uh, like, uh, how's the relationship, what are the relationships between veterans and police officers? Um, depends, you know. Um, some veterans look down um, on police officers because they basically think, oh, well, that guy never did anything as intense as I did, so he's just a big wussy. Um, and then oftentimes there's a, there's a respect um, between first responders and veterans because we're, we know that we have done similarly intense things. So sometimes it, it can be hostile. Sometimes it's not. It just kind of depends on the individual veteran. Um, but there is a lot of, um, there actually is a lot of uh, cross compatibility between veterans and first responders. So most veterans um, miss, I don't want to say most, but a decent chunk of veterans miss the intensity of security service. So they'll either become firefighters, EMTs, or cops as a way to chase that high while still getting to sleep in your own bed. Oh, and also about military life. Like, what was day to day life like? Like, where did you guys sleep? How did you guys sleep? All right. Where? Like I'll, that kind of stuff. All right, I'll answer this in a few minutes, but I do have to let you go. And I also would not mind doing this again at some point. Um, but but we are pushing about uh seventy minutes, and I, I do have to oh. do some other stuff tonight. Um, oh, so, so sorry about that. No, 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 no problem. I. I love talking about myself. It's great. <laughs> so, um, so no, no, no. The um, so the military, yeah. So what is military life? So in boot camp, 
wake up at five, make your bed by 515. Be on line, which basically means standing at the position of attention waiting for the drill instructor. Um, change clothes into your uh, uh, PT gear. Clean up the room that you live in. You'll be out uh, to PT by 6 a.m. Work out for about 90 minutes to two hours. Be back, by, uh, be back inside by eight. Take a shower. That shower is not an individual shower. You are literally standing in a line with 60 other naked dudes. They turn on all of the showers at either hot or cold. Um, so like literally you're going from like burning my skin hot to like ice cold uh, at random intervals. And what you have time to do is you literally have time as you run through a shower bay of maybe 20 showers to soap yourself up and rinse yourself off by the time that you walk in a U shape in that shower bay. Get back, change into camis. Um, and then it kind of depends on what part, and camis are just camouflage uniform. And it depends on what part of boot camp you're in. Um, you could go to a schoolhouse, you could go to a rifle range training, you could go to a classroom in order to train um, and just do some like PowerPoint slides. Um, you could do any sorts of things. You could go to a confidence course, which is basically like a very intense obstacle course. You can go to an obstacle course. You can do anything throughout the day. You have no plans. Um, you do that stuff during the day. You'll eat lunch. You'll maybe have five minutes to stuff your face with food uh, before you're told to stand back up. Basically, by the time that the uh, first person is done eating their food, the last person has to also be done. So basically, the first person should eat slow so everybody else can have an opportunity <laughs> to eat. Uh, but if they eat too slow, they're going to get yelled at. Um, so... You maybe have like five minutes to eat three times a day. Um, you do that until about, I don't know, seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, seven, eight o'clock at night, um, <laughs> you'll, you'll get uh, smoked, uh, which is basically like worked out for whoever screwed up that day. They'll, uh, they'll go with the drill instructor and basically get smoked where they have to work out for an extra hour. Um, and then after that, you, you, know, you basically like clean your gear, organize your stuff and knock out. That's not every day, but that's most days. Um, in the military itself, not boot camp, um, it's basically more of a nine to five schedule. It's more of like an office job. Um, but then also you work out three times a week. Um, and then sometimes you have to do like annual qualifications, like uh, working out. And then also you'll get sent out for schools randomly um, for like martial arts or leadership training or, you know, uh, radio training or, or, or firearms training. Um, so really basically like working a desk job in camouflage utilities but then on occasion you get sent out for stuff and you have to work out three times a week where you're probably going to run three miles uh every single time and then work out for another hour to an hour and a half and that's monday wednesday and friday you're going to work out for between one hour and three hours uh well i i i guess we ha we have to end it here uh, yeah, okay we if I send you more questions on Discord like tomorrow or something. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll we'll end it here. But um, if you want to do another one sometime in the next week or whatever, I found this incredibly uh, mentally cathartic. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, so I do think about these things, and I have talked about them in the past. But it is, um, I don't know. It's weird being in, in this position. It's weird being a third to halfway through my life and then recounting uh, the good old days. You know, so. Oh, by the way, even though next week on uh, my civics project is going to be done, uh, can I can we still have this again because this is actually really interesting? Yes, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay, because I I still have uh, more stuff to ask. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, it, we can do it again before your civics project, or we can do it after, and I have no preference. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure formally talking to you and not on Discord chats with a billion other people. Not that they're <laughs> bad. I lo love all of them. But. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. But I appreciate you. I'll stop the recording and then I'll send this to you uh, shortly. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Connor. Yeah. Have a splendid night. Yeah. Catch you, bud. And by the way, when will we get the Lauren Southern debate? <laughs> you could have to edit that out.